Great. So it's time for us to continue our tech seminar. And now I wish to uh, call to the stage John Hare from Sensible Soccer. Welcome. Hello, everybody. Um, I've been making computer games for a long, long time. So this is going to be a bit of a walk through time uh, about graphics uh, in, in football games. So I used to run a company many years ago called Sensible Software. We were, had a number of hit games across Europe, including in Finland. Uh, and nowadays, I'm still working, and I'm working with the team in uh, Roolati here on a new game called Sociable Soccer. So, hence, from Sensible Soccer, which was 1992, to Sociable Soccer, which is like now. So this is how long this span of time goes. As Sensible Soccer was actually our second football game as Sensible Software. Uh, we made our first game in 1988, a football game called Micropro Soccer on the Commodore 64. Sensible Soccer was on the Amiga. And uh, actually, we set our company up in 1986. So a long, long time doing this. Anyway. Let's go to the next slide. I hope it just, there we go. So, this is a little trip through history about football games, the first part of this talk. So, the first football game is Sensible Soccer. Does, do any of you guys know this game? Oh, okay, good. So, Sensible Soccer, as in any game that comes out, is relative to the era it's coming out in. Any, anything you create, any piece of art, be it music or film or a book or a game, it's, it stands out relative to what's around it, the frame around it. And the frame around this time was, you had a game called Kickoff, which you probably, some of you guys also know on the Amiga, which was the best football game of the day, no doubt, Kickoff 2. Um, and then you'd had other games beforehand, including our old Micropro Soccer. But with Sensible Soccer, this was a, one of our first games on the Amiga. The Amiga was a 16-bit machine, so we'd gone from 8-bit graphics to 16-bit graphics, which had given us um, a lot more graphical power to do stuff with. So we had higher resolution on the sprites and stuff like this. So you can see on, on, on Sensible Soccer here, the key in the game was the, was the viewpoint that we, the vantage point we gave. Now, we made this by accident. Our previous game was a game called Megalomania, which was a god game, nothing to do with football. And it used this viewpoint like this, with these little men running around. They're actually like little cavemen and Romans and Victorian soldiers and biplanes and stuff. And whilst we were finishing Megalomania, we, um, we, we had this idea to make a, a new football game. And so the actual very first of these little men, because I was the artist, I was the artist, the, the only artist in the company for seven years. So these little men I drew as footballers, they were actually running around between these like castles and mines and stuff in Megalomania world, which was all about digging up resources and things. And when we put the little men and we made a pitch to the same perspective as our megalomania background by a total accident we learned that this perspective gave you a very good vantage point for uh, playing a game and especially in those 2d days when you weren't in 3d and you couldn't vary camera angles choosing your viewpoint was the most critical thing you could do in the game like what angle are you going from you're going side to side you're going top down or you're doing some like isometric view and what scale you're zooming in. Because once you set that, every single piece of graphics is set around that viewpoint and it wasn't easy to change it because they're all 2D manually done graphics, sprites, little pieces of background which are put together. So the pitch is actually put together with little tiles. The men are these little sprites. I think they were 16 by 16, including the shadow. Um, the ball was obviously very small. Um, and the reason Sensible Soccer was a, a big hit, it was a massive hit for us. It was uh, number one pretty much all across Europe anyway, not in the States or Japan, but in Europe, um, was that it had really fast gameplay. And, and again, the, the camera angle that we chose gave us the ability to have faster gameplay. If you have bigger graphics, very fast movement gives you that feeling of nausea. Even outside of VR, it can give you that nauseous feeling. Again, the more zoomed out you are, the faster your little things, objects can move across the background. So that could also apply to like a racing game. So anyway, the game was very successful. We did little tiny touches in this game, which aren't immediately obvious. Like this was the first game to have players with different skin color. So in all previous football games, every single footballer on the pitch had white skin and dark hair. I think everybody. So we added two key innovations 
blonde hair, which doesn't appear in this screenshot, and dark face, like brown skin. And this meant because the game was mapped onto a real world of football with, um, in the end, by the final version, we had one and a half thousand teams, 27,000 players, all researched. They needed to look at least a bit like they were, like give them blonde hair if they're blonde. If it's the, like the team from Nigeria, make the guys black, you know, so they actually look Nigerian. So this was all part of the identity for the, for the team and, and, and it worked very well for us. So this is my starting point of hit, for, no, this is my second starting point because Micro Soccer was before, but here's where our story starts. The menu view was very simplistic graphics. This is the Amiga, we, you know, we're back how many years? 26 years now. So you can see we were just going with blocks of color, text, drop shadows on the text, of course, some texture in the background. You couldn't do that on the Commodore 64, so this is advancement, you see. Um, but the menus are very simplistic, functional, basic graphics. I would, I would describe myself as an artist now, and I'm not an artist anymore. I just manage the design and creatively direct artists uh, and draw lots of irritating pictures for them as inspiration. But um, as an artist, I like things to be functional and clear as to what they're doing. That's more important to me than the look, is that you understand the function, because the functionality gives you the accessibility. And without the accessibility, you can't really get into the game. And you can't get your hit game going because people get lost hunting for stuff. So that's my own personal taste. And then you have the what I consider very ugly Sega Mega Drive version. I consider it ugly because I didn't do this art. This is, this is me letting go of the art strings after seven years in charge of running all the art in our company. And uh, we have these funny players with kind of ragged, looks like ragged t-shirts and some shorts when they were at school maybe doing PE. Um, but this is like the Mega Drive version. The reason the Mega Drive is interesting is because those kind of consoles, you know, you had, you had your, your NES, of course, and you had the um, VC, Atari VCS beforehand. But the Mega Drive was the first of what I would call the next batch of consoles, which then went on to be the PlayStation and Xbox and, and such and such. But Mega Drive was the first. The big advantage for us is that the... Mega Drive was in 68,000 language, which meant we could use all the graphics from the Amiga and the ST versions, which were our originals. So we handled those uh, internally. And then we have Sensible World of Soccer. So again, this is a, an in-game view. You get to see the advantage of this glorious viewpoint. This guy's taking a free kick. He can see clearly. He can pass back to this guy here. He can put it in the box to this guy here near the far post to this one near the near post. You can see the position of the defenders very clearly. This zoomed out viewpoint means you don't need a radar. Not meaning a radar means your eyes are always on the action. So the action can move faster without you having to flick your eye up to a radar and back again. So people often overlook the psychological impact on a game and the playability based on graphical choices. So you make a big pitch. Therefore, you can only see a few of the players. Therefore, you can't see who you're going to pass to. Therefore, you need a radar. Therefore, when you're playing it, you've got one eye on the radar and one eye here, so you're not so engaged with the play. So that's how it kind of works. It's a knock-on effect chosen by camera angles. Anyway, this game, let me, just this game for one second. This was our best-selling game of sensible uh, software. So it was actually put in a canon of the 10 most influential games of all time by uh, Stanford University in 2006, along with games like Space War and Mario and Tetris. Uh, and we were the only European developed game, and we're the only sports game. So this is our proper claim to fame, this one, and our, and our bestseller. And thankfully, I got my house off the back of this game, which was really rather nice. So, but we kept the view very similar to the original Sensible Soccer. And then with the menus, we were starting to go into more depth in the um, gameplay. So this is an example of one of the menus, and there's many, many menus, because you've got an entire ability to trade all the different players in the world, all 27, uh, 23,000 of them. You could buy and sell players. So we've got the pictures of the players' faces here. We've got their names. This guy who did this screenshot I found on the internet today, which was very nice, was a Hungarian guy, so he's a Honved fan. Um, and then you can see you've got the names of the players laid out on the pitch and you've got the different formations you can choose, and then you've got the ability to load user graphics and stuff. But again, graphically, this is very simplistic. 
You've got a background image, which is the same for all the menus. It's a sensible world of soccer kind of background thing. And simple blocks. Because this game has got a lot of information, like when you're searching through 1,500 clubs and 30,000 players and all these different statistics and different game modes, it's very important that the two things are important. One, that what everything does is very clearly laid out on the screen so you can read it easily. Secondly, and it's not obvious from this screenshot, but that your default cursor position, so when you jump, jump from this menu to that menu, where is the default cur where's the cursor going automatically? Because that will lead you through the gameplay as it needs to happen. It's similar on mobile games nowadays, where we make something flash to make you attract to it, so you press it next. With a, with a uh, joystick-controlled game or a joypad-controlled game, you've also got to think about the default position you're putting the cursor on. Because it's not only flashing, you've got a cursor position. So if someone just presses the button fast like this, they're going through all the screens you want them to go to. So any well-designed game, um, any addictive game that does well, you'll find the menu structure, which often people are so bored with in games. They don't want to do menus, but the menus drive the game, and you look at it about half the time. So I'm a big one for many menu systems and how they're structured. So then we come on to the next horrible episode of Sensible Soccer. So unfortunately for us, the whole industry wanted to move to 3D. Now, we were quite happy in our 2D world for a very good reason. We were the best-selling developer in Europe at that time because we didn't just have Sensible Soccer. We had Cannon Fodder, Megalomania, other games selling really well. What happened to us as a company as Sensible Software, and this is a lesson for anyone in a currently very successful company. So to, we'd had like five or six number one hit games on the trot at this point. You know, we were like riding the crest of a wave. We couldn't go wrong for three years. But then 3D came along, and 3D just chucked us right back at the bottom of the pile again, and for a good reason. Because we'd stayed with 2D so long, we actually found that we were about two years behind every other developer who'd moved on to 3D two years before us. So we had an advantage because we had a good name in the market. Um, we wanted to do Sensible Soccer 98. Every publisher we spoke to said it must be in 3D because 3D is the only way it's going now. You can't go back to 2D anymore. That, that world is dead. Fair enough. They offered us a lot of money, a lot of money for these games in advances, so we were very happy with this as well. But we had no experience with making 3D art in the studio at all. So we had to find 3D artists. Well, there weren't really any. And then you had the machines that you had, these crystal graphics machines. They cost £18,000 per machine in those days because this is early, relatively early 3D tech. So it was very high cost to get people going. And then the artists had no idea what they were doing in terms of polygons. So I, we were working on another game called Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll at the time. And it was about a rock star going around the rock world. Anyway, some guy was making this woman. She was one of the singers in one of the bands. And we looked, and in one eyelash, he'd used 10,000 polygons, if you can believe it. Because in the early 3D days, no one knew how to control anything or what they were doing. The programmers didn't know how to guide them because they were learning as well for us. So we went through a huge learning curve. And then on top of that, we tried to stick this 3D into a very fast game engine or around a very fast game engine, which was Sensible Soccer, made for 2D with easily turnable sprites. So if you look at Mario games, you'll notice, excuse me one second, With Mario games, you'll notice that the sprites tend to be round, rounder. The reason they make the right sprites rounder is because round objects, when you're moving around and animating, turn a lot easier than long, thin ones. So if you turn fast, your eye is more forgiving with a round object turning than a, than a long, skinny object because you see the limbs moving fast. It looks strange, but a, a rounder object like me these days would, will move a little bit, a bit, a bit smoother. So we ended up choosing this relatively stocky looking player because he was a bit thicker but of course you can see it looks really ugly and the w very worst thing for me as a game designer it took two years to get the engine to really show any graphics at all because in those days you had to write your own 3D engine before you could even display the graphics so that was a real real downside for game design and art because the artists would make stuff but they couldn't really see it running in the game they could make models but not see it running 
And then when it ran, maybe it needed to be modified. And from a design point of view, getting the game to play well was really hard because it was so late that we could actually get the graphics running to even play it, to tune it, to make it better. So Sensible Soccer 98, was a, it did OK, but for us, it was a big flop. For Sensible Software, it was a big downturn from a, being a successful. And again, the menus, we, we took a slightly different approach. Um, they're not that great. This is like a map of a map of Spain in the background, I think that is. Or France. No, it's a map of France in the background there. And uh, it must have been the World Cup in France. That's why we must have done the World Cup in France, I think. And then there's a World Cup group, but it's nothing much to say about these. They're boring, you know? The main innovation was the music changed. If you were in different leagues in different countries, the music changed to a different tune for the country. So then we did nothing with Sensible Soccer for eight years. And in fact, in 1999, we sold our company Sensible Software to Codemasters. And uh, they chose not to focus on Sensible Soccer. We did a bit of stuff with Cannon Fodder. Some of it came out, some of it didn't. But then in 2005, they decided they wanted to resurrect Sensible Soccer. Uh, I had been with the company for a while, but I'd left for a few years. And then they asked me to come back and be a consultant designer on this Sensible Soccer 2006 game, which I uh, worked on with David Darling, uh, one of the owners of Codemasters, as a co-designer. We worked with a team in Sheffield. So this is different for me because I wasn't really part of the development team. I was a consultant designer for a company now owning the old IP I used to own. And uh, coming in, and the actual game was not bad. It played OK. I'm not that unhappy with the way it played. I'm very unhappy in the last week that there was a decision made in order to fix a bug where the game was crashing that if the ball got anywhere near the goalkeeper, he just sucked the ball to his hands. This actually destroyed the gameplay entirely, but fixed the bug. Uh, and at this time, uh, myself and David, as the two designers, the team were getting so tired of our constant input about improving it, they... We were, we were shut out the room for about three weeks or four weeks at the end, the result being this bad bug fix. But actually the game, you can see the pitch looks a lot nicer. The graphics have moved on. I think this is a, an Xbox version we're looking at here. Um, and we made some innovation on the way that we highlight the players with arrows. And I think the C means he's a central midfield player. I'm trying to remember how that worked. And we had these weird looking players. So again, the problem with not being able to control everything because it's not your company anymore, is you don't control some decisions on art. Now, for some bizarre reason, the decision was made to give the players these huge heads, like those plastic models you get from, from a garage. And the decision was also made to cell, to cell shade them. So here you're seeing like cell shading look because it was fashionable to think about that at the moment. Now, what annoyed me about this is that I did the original Sensible Soccer art, and everyone said, well, the Sensible Soccer art guys have got big heads, haven't they? It's like, no, their heads are four or five pixels wide. They're not big, you know, it's as small as you could make it in the tiny sprite. Um, but I got outvoted in Codemasters, so we went ahead with the big head graphics, which I didn't like, because to me, it took the feeling away of what we were meant to be doing. But you can see it gives it a very stylized look. So it gives it a different kind of cartoon look. Um, it's not my interpretation of what the Sensible Software games were about, but it was someone else's. Uh, but there you go. The stadiums were not bad for the day. They're actually quite nice. And then <clears throat> the menus. Menus with big heads, I've called this slide, because I don't like the big head players. And the menus are like, OK, they're relatively functional. They work OK. This is a kit editing menu. Um, this little green circle's because I nicked it off the web today and someone had a green circle for their little picture gallery that they'd stolen on the, on the web. So the menus of this game were okay. There's a bit of texturing in the background, you can see. Um, lots of colors compared to what we had on the Amiga. Lots of different shades of orange and stuff. And so Sensible Soccer 98 was not really very successful. In fact, it, it killed the, like, the chance of us doing Sensible Soccer 1999 or 2000. This was meant to be a, a three-game series, and it turned into one game, and that's it, that's your lot, which we were quite relieved about. And so, personally, I did a whole bunch of consulting and working on different sorts of games, not football games. And then, um, in about 2006, 
uh, no, about 2008, I worked, with, I worked with about four different consulting on different football games. And one of them was with a friend of mine called Mev Dink, who's uh, one of the, the godfathers of the Turkish games industry. And he invited me over to Istanbul to work on his game. So his, this game was called I Can Soccer. And it was basically an 11 versus 11 match where everyone was a different player online at once. And it was actually a pretty successful game uh, in Turkey, but never really made it outside of Turkey. But working with Mev got me the appetite for making a new football game. And uh, I had an idea for this game, but I didn't really have a team that I could work with to do it. So I, I shelved it for many years, actually. And then three years ago, I met some guys at PGC in Helsinki. So that would have been 2015. So this is a long, long shelving before bringing this to life. And uh, they showed me a demo of um, a game, Ice Rage, they've made. You guys might know Ice Rage. It's a mobile ice hockey game. And uh, they just formed a new team called Combo Breaker. So if any of you know Yoni or Amar or Sammy or Sammy, the guys at Combo Breaker, they'd come from Remedy and Mountain Sheep and Digital Chocolate and Next Games in different places, and they'd formed a company. And I was very lucky because I met them just at the point where they had just formed the company for one or two months. They didn't really have anything particularly in the pipeline. And I said, well, I've always wanted to make this next football game. Do you want to make a game together? And the guys said, yeah, okay. So we started making a new football game. This, this, and, and the idea was, we couldn't call it Sensible Soccer because that was owned now by Codemasters. So we came up with a, the name for Sociable Soccer as a kind of close but not violating alternative. And so I literally went back to the drawing board for this new football game based on my experience of working with my friend Mev also on another game I worked on called Football Superstars, a Real Madrid game I worked on, and a couple of other little football bits. And I penciled this thing together, right? So this is proper designer work. So the idea for this was to try and communicate the vision and the content of what social soccer would be. And there was one big premise about the game. The premise was that at the start of the game, it asks you, which club do you support in real life? Because I assumed in the background you've got this whole world of sensible, like sensible world of soccer in the background. You've got all the clubs, the whole world there. So the first question is, which club do you support? The second question is, which nationality are you? And the third one was, which of these funny groups of other fun clans would you like to join? So this one is like secret police. So in this example, his team, national team he's chosen is England. His club side is Liverpool. And his clan side is the secret police. So the clan side, the idea was it could be university students, or it could be heavy metal fans, or it could be butchers, or it could be bored housewives. It didn't really matter. The point is you chose one of these stupid clans. So anyway, basically, you're then this player. This was the idea. James Locke in the middle here. And you're playing for all three teams. And we're constantly keeping the statistics on the, for all the teams, how many you've played, win, draw, and loss. How your performance is, you know, are you in the top 23% of the players for England at the moment, or the top for Liverpool, or the top for your clan? <clears throat> so you've got these goals to be trying to get to certain levels of attainment within your grouping so that you can get rewards back from the game. Um, and then you've got ratings, different caps. So you've got caps and appearances for your teams there. Um, and then we have like a, a single player mode here. So this was the like online play. So you play for your clan, your clan being either your funny secret police team or your country, which would be England, Finland, whatever, your club, which would be Liverpool, Bayern Munich, whatever. So three clan games online simultaneously. You can choose which one you play for. This was the original idea. It's changed since. And then a single player thing of... All the competitions in sensible soccer, which I say lightly, but that's, well, currently in social soccer, that's 67 different cups, leagues, and tournaments throughout the world replicated in real life. You choose your team, you go and play, which gives you an offline game to play. And then a hot seat version, which is basically everyone playing on the same computer. So that's like set up your own little DIY competition so your three friends can play a league on the same machine. Again, this was a very popular game mode in sensible soccer. And then options here. So this stupid drawing I did 
was the inspiration for the start of where we started the game off. And now I'm going to take you through with sociable soccer, how it's kind of like metamorphosized because we started this project over two and a half years ago in October 2015. And now we're in August of 2018. So the next step was for Amar, our lead artist. And Amar was going to be talking here today and actually couldn't come, so I'm in his place here. So he took this picture and we kind of came up with this as a, an artistic visualization of my drawing. It's a first step. And he's pretty much copied it relatively faithfully with a few innovations because we're always innovating as we go. So I'm England. I'm third position in League B of the national teams. You can see that... Um, I've got three opponents to choose who I want to play from. This was the idea then. Uh, this idea has since been dropped because it's too hard to do online. But the idea was you choose which one to play for, against. And the same over there. And it also tells me, for England, I'm in the top 3% at the moment of England fans. So this is going to give me some reward from the game if I can hang on in there before the timer runs out because it's ranked today. So these were early ideas that would push things through. And you can see he's a pro or a legend. You're still... Your character is the player, and you're the player moving between the teams, but you control the whole team when you get there. And here we see we've got Spanish Cup. You can continue if you want, because you've chosen your competition. And this is going and playing with your friends there. And at this stage, we were still calling this thing John Hare's Sociable Soccer. Now, let me go through this bit here. So when we initially oh, launched the game, here we go. We've got the early graphics, the very first Sociable Soccer game we had. So the first thing was to prove... And the graphics look not great, but it was to prove the gameplay works. So it's all about getting the camera angle right, getting the controls right, getting the speed right. Have we got the basics of a good football game in here? Is it worth pursuing this? And it actually played pretty well on an early demo. Not great, but pretty well. And so we took this initially this top-down view to get started. And also, we started working in Unity. And for the whole team, this was the first time everyone had worked in Unity. So... There's a bit of Unity learning curve going on here, but I don't care what anyone ever says against Unity. Compared to what we did in 1998, waiting two years for the engine to be finished, it's better. I can promise you, 100 times better. So, and of course, the advantage of Unity is you can go totally across platform very easily. So there's other massive advantages to preceding years. You know, we had to do all the ports from scratch in the old days. So... When we launched um, Sociable Soccer initially, it was still the, the, the era where you could get Kickstarters from games and actually try and get some decent money. And we made a bit of a, a gamble decision. So basically, Christmas was about to come up. There was going to be a big gap. And we wanted to know, were we going to make this thing or were we not going to? So we, between us, decided that we'd rather just go for it. So the, all the advice on Kickstarter is, have two or three months of planning before you do it. Get all your assets in place, get everything in place. Tell people what's going on and then make a big announcement. Well, we went against all the advice. We gave ourselves a week because we were trying to stuff it in before Christmas was going to start and everything was going to fall apart. And we very rushedly made a video, which is a really bad video of me talking for two minutes with a couple of pictures because we had no game to show in the video. Um, and it was still called John Hare's Social Soccer in these days. So... At the very start, we were trying to write off the back of my name, off the back of Sensible Soccer, as the main way to push the game. And you can see the early logo. It's a bit more influenced by the Sensible Soccer logo, so it takes some of the, the lettering style, which is called Aztec, I think, from memory. Um, it's like that. I designed the original one, so I should remember it, but I don't. So Kickstarter, in the end, to give, cut a long story short, you're told with Kickstarters that... You've got to make 20% of your money within the first three days. Well, in the first three days, we made nowhere near 20% of the money. And we knew within three days it was going to like eh, crash or fall off a cliff. So we gave it a while and we stopped. And the reason we stopped is probably because we were asking what people perceived as too much money for the game. We asked for, I think it was 300,000 pounds or euros. I can't remember the currency. But three years later, that doesn't seem very much at all, you know. So it just goes to show Nevertheless, we persisted through willpower, belligerence, and we started to find the style that we wanted for sociable soccer. So the only thing was, how are we going to do the player? So Amar, who's a really talented artist and a great character artist, if anyone recognizes footballers, you've got like a Gianluigi Buffon here, and you've got 
Paul Pogba in the middle there, and you've got Pirlo there next to him. And then the idea was this idiot guy here was like your player character in the middle of these superstars. And that was the kind of the feeling of the game. The problem with this view is that it's too infringing on copyright for player images. You can't get this close. And when you're doing, as it stands now, 30,000 players, you haven't got time to draw the faces. So in the end, although it's fun and looks nice, we drew away from this look. Another thing we experimented with was how we were going to make you play the games and get rewarded. So the idea here was, this is, don't worry, this is out of the game now, but this is how we started. This is, I like to work in this innovation way. So, so basically, the idea is, here's your, here's your club fruit machine. So you're Valencia. You work out how much of your prize money you want to play on this game. And if you, if you win, you get a bigger prize if you put more money on it. Then you press play. And then it, it's like a fruit machine. It rules through all the clubs. And it says Valencia versus da 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 da. Us, and, you know, and it comes up with your, who your opponent's going to be. So that's the idea of this. And you could play either the national one or the club one. It didn't matter. Whichever order you wanted. We've already got rid of you. See, the secret police have already gone from this design. We're down to two now. So, and we had your character here. So this was an early concept. And then we went forward with it a bit more. And this is kind of a mock-up. It's not a screenshot. It's more like a working shot here. So more sophisticated fruit machines, slightly more metallic, modern-looking ones. And this is all these positions of special players you can unlock to be on your team that we've got now, legend players coming up and stuff like this. We've got football crests going. We had to change this crest because this is violating now. You can't use a red bird and a Liverpool badge. I've learned a lot about this stuff this game. Now change them all. So we went more sophisticated fruit machines. When you got a prize, it came, out, it came out of this little thing. It kind of was a door and it went down and you got the prize out, which was actually a bag full of loot and stuff. Anyway, luckily, after a year and a half of wasting our time, we binned the fruit machines. But just before we binned them, we started to add another element to the game. Here you can see this guy's won a prize there in his fruit machine there. And this is your manager character. So now this is the idea that you're the, the player and the manager's saying, come on, son, your club needs you. See you again. There's your manager. So we started to play with adding more characters into the game on the menu side, of course. And then we went absolutely crazy with these managers. And Amar, who's very good at doing characterization pictures, we use his strength. And so we invented all these different manager characters and locked these different competitions like the English Cup and the World Cup and the Japanese League and a German fifth division are way behind these managers. And when you get to a certain progress level, the, the tournaments unlock and stuff like this. So this was the next stage, using these characters. Um, and at the moment, we, we, we're feeling around for the best formula for structuring everything. And so then we went to the next stage. Andrew here, who's sitting in the audience with one of my colleagues, uh, we work together on this boss mode. So in boss mode, you've got now your chairman character there, the one with a big cigar. And, and, and now we've, we've crucially changed one thing in the game at this point. We decided rather than you being a player, you should be the manager. So you're not the player. So the player, you being a player is now binned. You're now the manager managing the team. So here's your manager character. This is me. I'm this guy here. And the chairman's saying, keep us in the top two and I'll extend your contract. And he's setting us little targets as we go through a competition. In this case, it's a Spanish uh, cup. And as we get to the various stages here, we get a bit of a reward and we advance our character and we get little unlocks and progress. And eventually we unlock better and better and better competitions until we're the master of the universe. And of course, this is the single player game mode, not the, not the four player game mode. But then we moved into um, this concept we started the concept of player cards. So the next thing to change was that rather than collecting player models, you collected cards. So these cards have been through many designs. This isn't the first design. This is a design from about nine months ago, I think. But it shows each player. We've learned some things here. Let me show you what we've learned. The names have all got messed up letters in them so they don't violate because we don't have a license. The badges here are actually not the real badges. They're all generated badges from a system of backgrounds and symbols given three colors. And all of them deliberately do not violate any copyright of anybody, but they give you that feeling 
for a club. And we learned that this three-letter little thing you can put underneath the badge is safe. You can use that. So we use this under the badge. So you're using art, not only to make a game look nice, but to convey information. All of us do this with art all the time. So then we looked at how we background the badges, getting the poses of the players, different for a different kind of skill of players. Obviously, this shows off the player models now a little bit more in the cards. So, and then, of course, we had the manager with the players. So we've got the manager now with his tactics menu, moving players around and unlocking cards and stuff. And then, because we're cross-platform, and we've been focusing on the PC for quite a while, um, and the Steam version came out in early access about 10 months ago. But recently, our, our attention has also switched to the mobile version, which we've always been doing anyway to get the controls right. We've also had VR versions and all sorts of weird versions of the game kicking around. And so now you can see a more full idea. We've added a top bar here. So you've got top bar menu options. You've got your manager character. You've got the player skills as you're selecting them. And really, it's all, this whole thing is about the slow evolution of a game system, which I'm trying to show you guys through the pictures. And then what happened was in November of last year, I had a meeting with a Chinese company in the UK, a publishing company that specializes in sports games that needed a football game. And after a long discussion over a number of months and a few different visits, about a month and a half ago, we signed a contract with them to do a game with them. And it's a Chinese Super League licensed version of social soccer published via China Mobile, because they work with China Mobile. So this, this, this can now hit hundreds of millions of users, our game, by going to China first, which is slightly weird. I've been doing a lot of business in the background, because I do the business as well, and I've been holding out for a, a deal with the publisher that actually gave us a good advance, and we got it in China, which was great. So you can see here, it's just all on, there's a little bit of influence of Chinese now. You can obviously see the writing. We've got these green, blue, and purple... Uh, notations for the value of the player because green, blue, purple and orange are kind of like standard ways of doing card valuations in different games in China and they've got a big history of card collecting games so we then had to fuse our player collecting for football thing with the card collecting methodology in China so we're starting to adapt it based on a different culture um, and uh, what else can we see here the top bar now has kind of changed a bit so you're not selecting game modes from the top bar You've got kind of like your player, your manager here, he's in level, you can see how he's leveling up, you can see his club. And then you've got, of course, that's all the buy extra card packs, get more currency bits in the corner here. And because we're in China, we use two currencies rather than one because they have to use two currencies for legal reasons in China to get the game through their government. So different changes going on. You can see the nice Chinese text at the bottom. Bit of a hybrid screenshot, this. But this is, gives you a bit of a better picture of where we are now on the point of about to release in China. And here you can see in more detail that kind of very Chinese styling. It's all a bit, sometimes a bit overdone from, for a European eye, especially when you get three or four players of totally different colors like this next to each other. But in a way, it's quite nice. It's quite nice to move to a different, um, different look. And of course, the branding has to change. So we have here... Combo Breaker, that's our team here in Helsinki. And then Tao Studios, that's my company in the UK. And then this is the CSO logo, which says Ultimate Stadium Soccer or some Chinese thing. Apparently, it's a very good name in Chinese with the logo. And then you've got Powered by Sociable Soccer. So we've now made Sociable Soccer the engine powering a Chinese league game in China. But we've also done a deal with these guys in Asia. And in Asia, um, it will just be called Sociable Soccer. So. But this is a fully licensed version now, so we can use the images of the players, the real badges, etc. in China. So what does the game look like internally? Well, this is what the game is looking like now internally. So all the while we've been upgrading the way we draw the stadiums, the way we do the lighting, the way we draw the players, the way we render stuff. And you can see the audience, which is now pretty good, which uh, wasn't around much in the old days. Are actually, our, sadly, our mobile audience are no more than flat, characters because we couldn't afford the full poly ones but um it gives you an idea of how the game's looking now and in terms of the way it plays 
of course, we're in the world of 3D now. So you can choose multiple angles. So, of course, we have to do the classic sensible soccer angle, up and down. And this is pretty much how the game is looking right at the moment, in the up and down angle. But, thanks to Unity 3D and modernity, we can flip the whole game side to side. And what we found is that younger players who are used to FIFA and PES definitely prefer this game angle. The guys who like the top down are all the older guys who are reminiscing about retro football gaming. So we can, we can do either. This is our default angle at the moment. And we're still working on this stuff, but we've got nice things like the, the four-way shadows and stuff baked in, a bit more sophisticated looking, a lot better than how it looked when it started. And of course, if you zoom in a little bit more, you can see the player detail, which is now pretty good. It's not at the level of FIFA or Pro Evolution Soccer. We don't have licenses, so we're not trying to make the face look the same, because we can't anyway. And there's a lot less work to do a few faces rather than a few thousand. So this is kind of where we are now. And the question for us is how high can we jump? By that, I mean not only with the game and how it looks, but publishing-wise. We're talking to a number of different PC and console publishers. We've got a deal signed on mobile in Asia. Now we're trying to get a deal signed on mobile in Europe and North America. We're talking to other people, luckily going to Gamescom soon. And that's kind of where we are. So this is just about the end of the talk. I know it's not all been about art, but I hope it's interesting for you to look at one theme here, in this case, football games, and look at the evolution through time and how things change a little bit and how we, by, by being open-minded about how we go about things, we can end up with the best results. That's, in my experience, always the best way to make games, to start off with a plan, but be prepared to modify it to make the game better. Uh, I'm John Hare, that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Are we... Do need time? I believe we can have one question okay. from the audience. Anyone has a question or a comment? Yes. Yeah, one question, no pressure, yeah. But okay, uh, you mentioned that, that they are adapting it for the Chinese market. I mean, there's one the thing that's slightly... I'm worrying about that. I understood that usually when Western companies do Chinese architecture, it ends up to them looking like taking the piss from out of, their, out of the way they build buildings. How do you avoid that sort of effect? Ah, this? this is because the company we're working with, uh, the, the, the company we're working with, have done a few football games, and actually one of the guys who we're working very closely with, although he doesn't speak a word of English, and we work through an interpreter, is a really leading football game designer in China. So actually. I'm working directly with someone of my equivalent in China right now as the lead designer, which is great. So we can talk about football very well, the language being the only barrier. He understands football really well. He understands how the Chinese system works really well. He's had a, a bunch of very massively selling games in, in China already. He understands how when you've got what they call a draw card system, like when you put cards into packs, how you balance those packs and how you monetize that and make it value. He understands that at the back of his hand, you know? So skills we don't have, he has. The stuff about the look, we just listen to, 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 to what they think works and doesn't work. Obviously, we want it a bit more like our way. But it's not so different to what we were doing in the first place. We've changed the look of the player cards. We've changed the layout of the main menu a bit. But in my opinion, it's better than it was anyway. Uh, we've, we've focused on the Chinese league a bit more. Obviously, the worst thing is when we look at the game now, all the writing's in Chinese by default, and you can't read it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just adapting to a system. You know, you, you, at the heart of it, it's a football game which will play in any country. So it's just adapting the way that is skinned in a way, both just not just visually, but also economically and structurally. What you put in, what you leave out. You know, the, the, the concept of buying card packs is seen as a bit aggressive in Europe. So we'll tone that down in Europe. And we've got other game modes, to, other ways of doing it to manage that in Europe. Also, we've also got a free-to-play game and a premium game at the moment because we're premium on Steam and free-to-play here, but with much more content on the Steam version. So it's about balancing and between, between these different things. But yeah, working with a Chinese designer is how we manage to do it. We're not guessing and patronizing them. Okay, thanks.